Hey everybody, how are you guys doing? I'm Eric Erlock, and this is another talk on logic, philosophy, and De Morgan, his laws of symbolic transformation in my talks up and through Lewis Carroll, Wonderland, and Modern Logic. So Augustus De Morgan, who lived from 1806 to 1871, is most famous for early work on symbolic algebraic logic and for formulating his De Morgan's Laws, which we can express as neither A and B is equivalent to not A nor not B, and not A or B is equivalent to not A and not B, which you can see symbolically, and I will present you in images as I work through this. So, and you can find in my notes online, uh, that not bracket A and B is equivalent to, I often use an equal sign instead of a triple bar equal sign because it's easy to type and find for students and, and myself, equals and is equivalent to bracket not A or not B, and the uh, not bracket A or B is equivalent to bracket not A and not B. That's strangely... What De Morgan found out in common speak, after I wander through all of that verbiage, is that and and or have a special opposite sort of relationship. Others had seen something like this before, but I am fascinated by and and or, and I am fascinated by what could or could not be the chess moves of thought, and I always have been, psychology, logic, philosophy, gesundheit, and what De Morgan found and put into laws, which may or may not be laws of thought, depending on formal or informal logic, or whether or not either is thought and or basic or essential to it. And keep in mind that psychologists don't simply study formal logic and understand that's how thoughts necessarily or should work, all of them together, but that and and or are strange inverses of each other. Now, it isn't true that all languages have an and and or, but there are human practices, we just had mill, that are inclusive and exclusive, and are words and and or and the words that you find in cultures that connect thoughts together, which don't all have to be the same sets of words, are inclusive and exclusive in ways that De Morgan tried to symbolize as laws and I do believe that Lewis Carroll is playing with those and other things in Wonderland and, and The Looking Glass. Specifically, when the Cheshire Cat tells Alice, well, if you go this way, you would have this. If you go this the other way, you would have that. There is strange plays with either or inclusive, exclusive, ors, and such. And But all of that was in unsteady formation through De Morgan, Carroll, Frege, onward through Wittgenstein's early and then later work. Um, Wittgenstein's early work with Truth Table seems to have set down in ways some of what De Morgan was saying, such that I put to you in my notes, and symbolically, I would represent this most in a more post-early, oddly enough, Wittgensteinian way, with and in one way and or in another, similar to the symbols you find in the image of the king and queen of hearts, actually, where that I believe the king has a lot of this kind of symbol and the queen has a lot of this kind of symbol. De Morgan and Carol and others were playing with those symbols and trying to understand relationships between things like adding and subtracting in thought, which we just had with Mill. I mentioned with Mill that Alice is asked by the queens to do sums, and she's asked if we take a, a bone away from a dog, what's the remainder? And Alice says, These, this is a strange sort of math, I don't know. And they say, well, the dog's temper is left over. Clearly, Alice can't do sums, which is doing math with an emotional remainder as a motive left over, as an object, oddly, as the answer. That's, while well, Carol's playing with that, and I love that for other reasons, De Morgan uh, is trying to formulate how and and or work as rule math-like processes. That's going to be central to formal logic, and Lewis Carroll had De Morgan's son apparently paint him tiles for his fireplace, which are animal characters, in fact. So all of this is very richly in the history of modern, formal, and I'd even say informal logic and psychology. And it is interesting and true that not all cultures have words and and or, and or can be 
perceived as inclusive and exclusive, I argue, and also as inclusive, exclusive ways of use. And you can see how we use ways of talking with words to include and exclude things in groups and practices, which is the real re <laughs> logic in actual full mind-body practice. We learn first and foremost as children before we ever abstract it or come up with anything like uh, what we believe to be mathematical rules about it. But De Morgan here is very key for understanding what Mill is gr grasping at and then Carol is trying to work and play with. And all of that prefigures Frege, Wittgenstein, and then modern logic, as well as Wittgenstein's later work, which I prefer. So let's get back to De Morgan and his life and his work in what will be indeed a shorter video than the last on Mill. De Morgan was born in Madurai, India. I don't know I'm pronouncing that right. To a lieutenant colonel serving the British East India Company. The same of Mill's father and Mill, in fact, were higher up involved. It is interesting, in fact, that a lot of these folks are involved somewhat with India in the history of logic through their family. And in fact, Lewis Carroll jokes in one of his works that let's say that we wrap everything up and we explain everything and then the couple get to marry happily after the villain dies somehow and their rich uncle dies and leaves them a fortune. He's clearly mocking, we would say, soap operas or something like it, but in his day, of course, serials similar from Dickens and then post playing with that and onward. That he says, and uh, the uncle from India. Why India? Because it turns out, Lewis Carroll jokes, uncles can't get rich anywhere else. Which means uncles are going to India and getting rich. It sort of implies, uh, Carroll seems to imply, well, off in the boonies doing things that aren't entirely uh, well sane in, in the you know British countryside. But, again, I'm not going to try to th read into what Carroll says there right here. But... Yeah, Carol is critical, clearly, of uncles in India. Um, and De Morgan's family is somewhat involved in India. And Mill's family was involved somewhat in India. Boole, next, is the family somewhat involved in India. And you can't really find much about how Indian logic did or didn't influence this stuff. But again, see my videos on Indian logic, and I can only suppose. Because I can't find it in print. And I haven't printed anything myself on that, so heck. So speaking of fancy French words, such as Saint-Simon's socialisme, as we had last time mispronounced uh, in the last talk on Mill, a lieutenant, a lieutenant literally means a placeholder, a minor officer, lieutenant, as in in lieu of, in place of, and tenant, uh, occupies an apartment, like mine here. A colonel, which looks like colonel, I always thought to say it that way as a kid, and, you know, tried to learn better now. Pronounced colonel by English speakers, confusingly, it leads a column, which is why it's a colonel, or a colonel. Mis uh, mispronounced, perhaps? A portion of a large marching army, a, car a column of an army. Much as a brigadier leads a brigade, which is actually a group of warriors of undefined size as need be. Kind of a, a more organized gang of sorts that can expand and contract as needed for the weird outlying task, perhaps. Or, well, again, I uh, speak of what I don't know. Augustus moved to England when he was seven months old. His mother wanted him to become an Anglican minister, but de Morgan became a mathematician and an outspoken atheist. Attending Trinity College at 16... He became a student and friend to Waywell. Again, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, Waywell. Mill's opponent. And with him, De Morgan got to work renovating algebra and logic to give each a rigorous theoretical systematic foundation to explain both using the fewest assumptions and ideas as possible to make them clear and useful. At the time, Oxford and Cambridge, the two great English universities, required theological oaths that barred Jews and non-Anglican Christians from teaching. I mentioned to my students, in the day of Lewis Carroll, in the mid-1800s, it is very important to understand that the West simply hasn't just gotten along entirely as a culture and neither as Islam and much love to everyone. People very much speak about, oh, the West has this mind state or Islam has this mind state. There are moving parts within all of these groups. 
in the 1800s, it would have been illegal for a German Lutheran who didn't convoit to come and teach at Oxford. So you wouldn't have had these are this is why in Lewis Carroll's day, British empirical ideas were not were somewhat verboten, but not in German. It British universities simply by not talk at Oxford not talking about them but they were all the rage and people talked about it but they weren't lectured about it because it wasn't considered civilized like the classics you know and the Greek and Roman ideas and so but the German ideas were also very influential Kant and Hegel were very influential but officially Kant or Hegel you know even if you pulled them up out of the ground they couldn't come teach miraculously enough at Cambridge or Oxford because they were German, you know, whether or not they were Lutheran, atheist, Gesundheit, what have you is. So the, the idea, it's again, and not trying to labor the point, but it is interesting that again, you know, the Irish were or weren't welcome as Catholics here and there or not at, you know, and so you have, again, that German ideas versus British ideas, both German and British ideas were very much the rage in Lewis Carroll and De Morgan's days, but they actually were not taught, and actually, again, um, you could not have Catholic, Irish, or German Lutherans come teach at Oxford uh, or give guest lectures with anybody doing, uh, you know, hand signs or otherwise uh, to interpret. So, yeah, at the time, Oxford and Cambridge, the two great uh, universities, again, barred non-Anglicans from teaching. Libertine-minded academics and others decided to establish London University in 1826 as a secular alternative. And De Morgan, who was uh, an outspoken atheist, was hired to teach mathematics. Again, atheist at this time is a broader category than some might think if you are thinking just, uh, but I am not the expert on De Morgan's beliefs or understandings. Atheist often can be a catch-all term, which means not traditionally theist. Keep that in mind also. Um, but that's not to say that De Morgan was not a hardlining materialist atheist, um, but that is more as it is known today. But, again, it was the 1800s. The And he, De Morgan, though, became a leading member of the London Mathematical Society. He was taught to teach at London University as it was formed, and the Society for the Diffusion of Useful Knowledge. It's a great thing one might want to continue and or resurrect. In 1866, when a Unitarian minister was denied the chair of mental philosophy, as opposed to, I guess, your elbows, De Morgan resigned, as he had before, in protest over lack of religious neutrality. As even though he was an atheist, he was against the chair being given or withheld due to the religion or lack thereof of the holder. Awesome. Consistency. It's all we have nowadays. In a letter, De Morgan's friend Sir William Rowan Hamilton joked with him that his copy of Barclay's work, the Irish bishop and, and idealist philosopher, was not his. Because like Barclay and De Morgan, he is himself an Irishman. Presumably, as he implies, he can't afford his own books while holding, holding a noble title. De Morgan wrote back that Hamilton's book was certainly not his, but Barclay's, of course. But it is all right for Hamilton to use the word mine either way. Which is tricky and nice. Good wit. To mean a book he doesn't own or to mean a book he didn't write. But to use the word both ways at once is not, much like the Irishman who was hauling up a rope. And after a while with no end in sight, cried out, Somebody has clearly cut off the end of this here rope. Uh, yeah, the, the ain't isn't it. This fits with Nicholas of Cusa's observation, treasured by Hegel, that we somehow know a circle is infinite, which apparently four- and five-year-old children just learn to give up and not, you know, be like, I don't know. Like, nah, nah, nah. Because it just, nah, it's just going to keep God, I'm not going to bother to trace it out or think it out beyond that, like everybody else. And it's odd, we lose the wonder of a child and then become functional individuals, sadly. Because you just give up on a circle counting it out or knowing how loud, how much it goes around. And three-year-old's like, I don't know. You know, it's like, oh, no, I need to figure that out. And four-year-old's like, five-year-old's like, no, you don't. Nobody does. But then we don't really notice that, oddly. It just goes on a path forever, potentially. It is a potential infinite, as Hegel argues, a circle right in front of you. So that is the infinite. In fact, space and time stretching off beyond any boundaries you're aware of is the actual infinite right here as being itself, unless you know it bounded, or uh, understand that, this is the practical and actual infinite. And that's the sort of thing Nicholas of Cusa casually says about God, this, other stuff, mustard seeds, tr growing into mustard plants, growing into an infinite potential of mustard seeds, he says is also a mathematician, and, uh, well, 
and a uh, Christian mystic. But there is no end at the end, and we cut off our explanations, just like the there's no end, uh, someone has cut off the end of this rope. It goes on continuously, therefore the end is cut off. It is more than two clever, witty Irishmen mocking their fellow countrymen for being poor and stupid in clever ways. Both lived through the Irish potato famine of the 1840s outside Ireland. As the joke, unfortunately, and terribly forgive me, goes, how many potatoes does it uh, take to kill the Irish again? Unfortunately, none, which again would be playing with substance and absence and presence and not so much anymore. Again, the uh, Irish famously don't move their arms when they dance out of reverence, which is incredible. Unlike the Scots, and I don't trust them. Again, they come in clans. De Morgan argued that symbols do not have inherent meaning, and we can use them as we like, using addition to mean reward and subtraction punishment, or virtue and vice, and those who hear us can believe us or contradict us as we please. But we can use these terms and symbols in regular ways if we agree to together. Now that is very similar to Mill. It is very similar to a lot of what Lewis Carroll says, although he also says things as uh, very much that there is objective truth most firm, but he also says it is very much just whatever in verbal practice we agree to. And Wittgenstein in his later work seems to have a view very, very much of that. I would say entirely, but again, who can measure such things, he would say. So Lewis Carroll, who read and followed De Morgan's work, wrote similarly uh, in his work on logic, that anyone can use the word white to mean black and the word black to mean white, and Carroll himself wouldn't care as long as the author is consistent and tells us what he's doing. He or she, we could say. And De Morgan centered everything on the equal sign, which in both algebra and logic signifies that what sits on each end has the same numerical or truth value, numerical for algebra, and true or false for logic, which is then becomes central for formal logic of Frege, Russell, early Wittgenstein, and then Wittgenstein moves into what uh, view very much like what De Morgan is already espousing here. De Morgan published his formal logic, which uh, Carroll owned, in 1847 after a correspondence with Hamilton in Dublin and Boole in Cork. We're going to get to Boole next, and then Carroll following. Aristotle and those who followed his syllogistic forms of logic argued that nothing follows from the combination of some A is B and some A is C. That is, very classic Aristotle, as we don't know if some B is C or anything else necessarily from this, but De Morgan showed that if we do have most as a connective or a qualifier as a something to latch things to this and that with words, etc., that if we say most A is B and most A is C, we actually can know in cases necessarily that at least some B is C. If we know that there were a thousand people on a ship and that most of them, over 500, were at the bar and the ship sank and most were lost, we also know that some who were at the bar had to be some of those lost to sea. De Morgan showed that a logic of relationships could replace Aristotle's syllogisms, which led the way to Boole's logical connectives, which relate two terms together. And that said, that is my short talk on De Morgan and how he leads and is interactive with the work of Boole and Carroll, and it is leading up to many videos on Carroll and then on formal logic, for which I'm doing this short talk. So... Much happiness, as always. Uh, hopefully you find some of that interesting and even some of that useful. And I will, as always, see ya, if I ever do, see ya.